Hi guys, I'm Jo Croft. You are listening to the Puppy Coach Podcast. Join me as I share my top tips, thoughts and experiences from my career as a vet nurse and canine behaviour specialist, helping owners form a strong, safe relationship with their dog. So for today's podcast, uh, we're going to start a series of guest speakers. And the first of those speakers to join me will be a fellow canine behaviourist and good friend, Ross McCarthy. Hi, Ross. Hi, good morning, Joe. Morning. So just to introduce you, it might take us 10 minutes to get through your credentials, but I think it's really important that people listening know how professional you are and how academic and how much experience you have. So Ross is a fellow of the Canine and Feline Behaviour Association, a member of the British Institute of Professional Dog Trainers, a member of the Guild of Dog Trainers and associate of the British Police and Services Canine Association. He, like me, graduated from Middlesex University with a master's degree in canine behaviour and psychology, and he was actually one of the first in the UK to do so. I didn't know that, Ross. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, one of the first two, I think. Good stuff. So for today's podcast, we're going to have a really good chat about working breeds in general and particularly the powerful working breeds, but specifically looking at Rottweilers. Um, Ross, you've owned Rottweilers for 14 years and uh, worked them for over 25. Um, And as I understand it, you have qualified them for working trials at CDEX and UD, as well as tracking qualifications. All of them have graded excellent temperament in assessments by the breed clubs and have achieved bronze, silver and gold in the Kennel Club Good Citizen Schemes. And you've also, which I also didn't know, trained one in personal protection. So I'm going to love to hear all about that. Ross has written widely for the UK press. He's a feature writer for Dogs Monthly for over 10 years. He's also contributed to other dog magazines such as Your Dog, Our Dogs and Dog World, as well as industry magazines such as Dog Training Weekly and The Pet People for Pet Plan. He's also written for The Independent, The Daily Telegraph and mainstream magazines such as Prima and featured regularly on BBC Radio. He currently runs a very successful dog behaviour consultancy called the London Dog Behaviour Company and he's also on the committee of the British Rottweiler Association. Ross has been training and mentoring students of canine behaviour and psychology since 2002 with various training establishments and institutions. Ross has a great deal of emphasis of teaching of professional conduct and customer service. I love that, Ross. So that's actually how you and I got together was me starting to do some courses with the uh, Cambridge Institute of Dog Training uh, and Behaviour, which is where we met. And when I was transitioning from the veterinary nursing field and doing a complete career change into dog behaviour. So that's got to be, what, over 15 years ago now? Yeah, it must be. I'd love to see your sort of 17, 18 years, I think, isn't it? So a long time ago. One of the things that I really wanted to pick your brains about today was this powerful breed consideration in training and, you know, how easy or not they are to train. And obviously I see them. I see them as mostly pet dogs and I've seen you work your Rottweilers. And I know that I'm very proud to watch you walk around Hyde Park with Rottweilers all completely under control and off lead, which is no mean feat. So I guess, first of all, the kind of working trials element, what does that involve? So, you know, somebody wanting to do a dog sport and what does working trials really entail? I mean, working trials, really, it's open to the majority of breeds. It's kind of like an old-fashioned sport, really, now. Perhaps its days are numbered. There are other dog sports that are taking over, such as UK dog sport, IGP, other exercises, really. Working trials contains elements of obedience and a lot of nose work. There is an element of protection as well. But um, the agility includes a six-foot scale, where the dog has to go over one side of the six-foot scale, down the other side, wait there, and then recall back over the scale on your command. Not many people are interested in doing that these days, so that does put a lot of people off the sport. So, I mean, obviously, Rotties in particular are a really big, heavy breed. Can they cope with that okay? How do you train them to do something like that? They are, funnily enough, for their size, they're incredibly agile. So going over a six-foot wall is quite easy for them. However, coming down the other side, as you said, they're big dogs. And dropping down onto their elbows and things is not very good for them physiologically, clearly. I won't be doing I've done that. I've really enjoyed my time in the sport. I met yeah. some lovely, lovely people. It's a really friendly sport. I won't be doing it again with any more Rottweilers. Are you just going to train them to obedience and, and use the psychology stuff? Yeah, I think I'll do some kind of sport, maybe like a competitive obedience. I mean, I'll train them in all of those disciplines anyway, because I enjoy the tracking elements and some of the nose work, certainly the obedience and things like that. Also, some of the other jumps as well, it's handy having a dog that will jump across a river or yeah. you know, a gate or whatever on, on your command if you're out walking. So I'll carry on doing those bits. 
what I know about Rottweilers is they can be quite stubborn um, and you have to kind of earn your stripes. I know whenever I've worked with your dogs and friends' dogs and clients' dogs and stuff, you kind of have a healthy respect for the power and size of the breed. If you've got, you've got your Rottweiler and you can't kind of bulldoze them around, what do you find to kind of motivate them and get them really revved up and interested in the work without actually losing control of such a, a powerful being? I think ultimately, really, it comes down to you building a relationship with the dog from the outset. So, you know, like you said, I guess to copy your phrase, to earn your stripes, it's having like a a kind of mutual respect and um, kind of lifestyle rules and boundaries around the house. So you have a healthy relationship. And then training wise, they're, they're fairly easy to motivate through the use of toys and obviously food and things like that as well. But um, really, it's the same with all breeds, in, inducing them to play during puppyhood and enjoy playing games with you with toys paves the way really to start training them for various aspects of working. So let's just say you run into trouble with a dog like this. You've got quite a strong dog that's maybe had some of those innate drives not opened up in the right way or received some sort of negative pressure when they've kind of just been a dog and doing what we bred them to do. They get a bad rep because of the size and and nature of the breed. When it does go wrong, what are the kind of considerations you have? Timelines, avenues for rehabilitation, whether you can ever realistically consider that dog will be safe in a domestic home without extra continuous work. Where do you kind of stand on that, Ross? It does really come down to owner education and owner knowledge. Can you safely rehabilitate a dog that's gone wrong? Yes, you can. Can every owner do that? And can the dog stay in that environment? Don't know. It depends on the individual cases. There are a number of specialists that do rehabilitate dogs and have them safely in society. But sometimes with inexperienced owners that aren't able or willing to follow what they need to do, then maybe the dog won't be able to stay in that environment. If you've got children in the house and there are other complicating factors, I kind of go in and look at my environment and decide whether actually my work is viable within that environment. If you've got a, a dog that's coming in with a bad rep and you've got children in the house and or you've got quite a small environment, you know, would that override whether you even bother trying to rehabilitate a dog in that situation? Would you actually just say, you know, look, guys, this is doable, but not here, unfortunately. Yeah. I think, as you said, it's always taken into account all factors. People that are sort of new to the industry, that they get absorbed with just solely looking at the dog. The dog's presenting this behaviour problem. How can I resolve it? But like you said, you do need to take into account a whole array of factors. And one of those, of course, is the environment. And if if you think that children or people or other animals or whatever are at risk and you can't quickly turn the dog around and make things safe then that's kind of your answer you can't work with the dog in that environment because of the dangers they present the power to weight ratio of the dog and bite force has to be a consideration in relation to a shih tzu or a cockapoo or something like that but do you think for that reason they do present as much more of a danger or do you think there are other factors just the fact they're a bit more difficult to manage that's more prevalent Yes, they do present more danger than the average dog simply because of the massive power that they have. So, you know, if you have an incident involving a child and a Shih Tzu or a Spaniel, the damage that the dogs can do is quite dreadful. But when you have the large, powerful breeds such as the Rottweiler, well, they can kill, can't they? You have to consider everything. And I think the key factor really is lots of people go out and buy these dogs, doing very, very little research Mm -hmm. into the breed, into their sort of innate, inherent drives and just expect the dog to get along and love the kids and everything else. And of course, they're a guarding breed. They do sometimes resource guard. And when you've got young children or even slightly older children and a a large, powerful dog that guards resources, that can be incredibly dangerous. I think the, the fact you mentioned resource guarding is really important because I'm finding now that I'm seeing a hell of a lot more resource guarding dogs, obviously struggling with environments and, you know, coming off the back of the pandemic. I think my perception of a Rottweiler or any of the big, powerful breeds, really, resource guarding is actually a really difficult thing to manage, not just safely, but actually from a rehabilitation point of view. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a whistle stop of what your considerations would be? Would you just begin by avoiding some of these big resourcey type issues, whether that be over food and food bowls and toys? I'm sure you've probably experienced it at home, right? With having had so many Rottweilers over the years. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, all of the Rottweilers I've had in puppyhood have guarded food bowls or lamb necks or whatever else. I've never had any sort of possession over toys or anything like that, but certainly high value food. If you deal with it in early puppyhood, you kind of put a stop to it then, which is far easier than 
yeah. having a confrontation with an adult Rottweiler in your kitchen. But like you, I mean, I've seen a massive increase in dogs that are resource guarding. To me, yeah. most of the time it's, it's inherent. So within the individual dog that you choose, I mean, it's a normal canine behavior, isn't it? To preserve yeah. resources. So some dogs have a higher propensity than others, but equally lifestyle, as you said, affects it greatly. And at the moment, since the first lockdown and everything, people have been getting puppies. I think a lot of the dogs have been bought to keep the children entertained. And their management of the dogs, obedience training, the house rules, inducing alone time, all of those things, people haven't been doing any of that. Let's just say I called you with a 16-week-old Rottweiler puppy about to go into that adolescent phase, and I've just started noticing some kind of uncomfortable behaviour around food, some growling, nothing too high level, but I want to nip this in the bud and ensure that it doesn't progress and become a problem. You know, we want to be respectful of the breed. This is a very much deed, not breed conversation, but we do also have to be professional and mindful and intelligent enough to respect that human beings have played a part in the evolution of this dog. And therefore we need to ensure that we support its generally innate drive. So in order for that to not become a problem, what kind of advice would you be giving somebody at that point? I would have a little look at kind of the general lifestyle of the dog in the home. I'm a firm believer, particularly with the larger breeds or the psychologically stronger breeds, that they do need clear structure, rules, boundaries in the home so that they all know where they stand. So I'd have a look at that in the first instance. And if it's guarding resources or seeking out little items and then trophying those, once perhaps lifestyle changes are in place and the relationship between dog and owner is a bit clearer, then I do something which is not probably very PC. I would take the dog on so that as the dog is aggressive to you over resources, you go and you challenge the dog and you make sure that you win, which is not something that everybody does and probably not what people should do without the help of somebody experienced that knows what they're doing regarding timing. I think it's really important because I think our industry is obviously built on not just academia, but it's built on experiential learning you develop your way of working. And I think it's really important that we as an industry are very open-minded with that. You know, what works for one doesn't work for another and what works for one dog doesn't work for another. You know, if I presented you with a 16-week-old Maltese Terrier, would you do the same thing? Probably not. No, probably wouldn't. But I think it's always the case if you have to think about the ramifications in the future, don't you? So, you know, your 16-week-old Rottweiler puppy growling at you in the kitchen it's not such a big deal. It's 16 weeks old. You can pick it up, can't you, and move it outside or whatever. Yeah. But this dog's going to grow up to be 45, 50 kilos. Yeah. Huge dog, huge yeah. teeth. Yeah. Um, and so if we can do something now at this stage to put a stop to it for good, and I found that works, then, you know, dog and owner can go on and have a nice, happy life together. Whereas if you don't yeah. stop it and you keep doing things that are going to compound it and fuel it, then yeah. you really do end up with a tiger by the tail, don't you? Somebody like you is extremely professional, calm, you know, very collected, very confident. We need to be mindful that somebody that isn't of that standing, who doesn't read dog body language well or easily, could also go and do the same thing and actually come off in quite a bad way. So, you know, I think it goes back to having a healthy respect for your ability, your knowledge, your skill, your understanding, your dog experience in the decisions you make in trying to handle it. Whenever I've worked Rottweilers, I find them massively rewarding. Unfortunately, I'm I'm savvy enough and have worked with dogs enough to know that it doesn't matter what breed and how experienced I am with the breed. When that dog has had enough, they've had enough. And you read that and you back away. And I think, you know, I really noticed that with Rottweilers. There's a lot of scenarios where you are looking at at dog behavior problems and it's very easy to say the dog is frightened. It'd be really good to hear what you think about this, because I think I I'm not sure I've ever seen a really genuinely fearful Rottweiler. In all honesty, if you come across Rottweilers that are severely inherently anxious and resource guarding because they're anxious, because they're frightened, not because they want. Yeah, lovely. But they should be powerful strong confident dog shouldn't they so yeah. I mean I, I have seen a couple of examples of the breed which are not perhaps as confident as they should be which is probably through nurture as opposed to nature and therefore do use aggression through fear but it doesn't really ever come across like fear do you know what I mean no. don't see them like no. you do like the typical German shepherds that we go and see that come running at you barking and then run away with their tails between their legs you don't tend to see that in the Rottweiler. 
I think breed predisposition and understanding the powerful breeds, I don't think there is a healthy enough respect for these amazing working animals that have been bred to do an amazing job. There's lots of defenders of the breed, but actually there's not a lot of people saying, you know what, this is what these dogs are capable of doing, be sensible. Do you feel that? Yeah, I mean, I get sick to death of like hearing all oh, their big teddy bears. And, you know, when I'm out walking, people make comments, you know, I've got a little Pomeranian, as you know. So I'll be out with the Rottweilers, my little Pomeranian, and people say, oh, I bet she's in charge. And you sort of laugh and say, oh, yes, but of course she's not. I mean, just, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they just get sick to death of it, don't you? Yeah, people make silly comments. They're very strong, powerful dogs and they should be respected. They're not big, cuddly teddy bears. They shouldn't be big, cuddly teddy bears. They're big, strong, powerful working dogs that need mental and physical activity and to be treated appropriately. I run Sheba, as you know, the German Shepherd. And I can tell you, I would happily walk through the woods in the dark and have done many times with Sheba by my side. And I would not do that with my Labrador and my Doodle. Now, whether that's a visual thing, because Sheba's as safe as houses. I've trained her from a baby and, you know, she's amazing for me. She's completely push button. But I do think that there's this inherent thing in her. I do think these guardian breeds have a level of instinctive behaviour that you know is kind of just bubbling under the surface. You know, you walking through Hyde Park or being at home alone with your Rottweilers, you must just feel like you've got bodyguards with you, right? That's part of the reason to have them. You know, when you're choosing a dog breed, you have to look at behaviours that you're going to get, don't you? I like the fact that when my neighbour over the road was burgled when she was asleep at night, I know that that's not going to happen to me, or if it does, (laughs) I'll quickly be aware of it. If people give me a hug and things like that, they might just come in between your legs and things. It's not launching an attack, but it's kind of, they're there and they're watching and it's just, and you have to watch them as well. You know, so when you go and help your visitors, you've got half an eye on the dog as well. Yeah, I can remember actually, I think we were at a CIDBT course and we had our cars in the car park together and I, your your boot was up with your rotties in the back and uh, and I noticed that your car was unlocked and I can remember coming and saying to you, Ross, Ross, I'm just letting you know that you've left your car unlocked and as the words were coming out of my mouth, you kind of looked at me as to say, yeah, and? Because you've got you know four of these beasts in the back that... Clearly, no one's driving off in your discovery, are they, at this point? <laughs> no, they soon, soon bring it back, wouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. So, OK, that brings us to something that I'm really interested in, but probably will never get involved in and make a point of saying when anyone rings me, I do not and will not train dogs for protection and security. It's not my bag. I focus my time very much on the pet dog in the pet home with a, a general picture of all sorts of dog sports. How you train a protection dog that will put somebody on the floor, but then is safe to live in a home and is pretty much push button around families does really intrigue me. It's like anything, isn't it? There's a, there are levels of protection dog trainers out there. It's a very lucrative industry and a very much required industry at the moment. It seems to be expanding. You know, lots of these sort of premiership footballers are buying these dogs because of home invasions and things like that. And I think when you're involved in that industry, you become aware of how vulnerable people are at home. There are various levels and you can buy a protection dog for about £5,000, which is a really badly trained loaded gun, if you like. Or you can buy from sort of twenty five to £70,000. Wow. Um, I, really wor- I know you're in the wrong job. I really um, am. I need to go and learn how to train yeah. protection dogs. <laughs> Next time they say, we train a protection dog? Say, yes, of course. I mean, people that train them properly, they rear them as puppies or select them from known breeders as adults and make sure they're absolutely bomb-proof temperament and then just teach them to respond to commands much in the same way as you do any other kind of training, really. So is the kind of real, uh, you know, I I don't want to say negative because it's all subjective depending on who you are, but the kind of more training aid-based training more prevalent so I'm thinking the shot collar training the harsh harsh methods are trainers going down that route still within the protection and security industry I know it it was rife at certain points it's just never been something I've wanted to be involved in really for that reason I don't think there's lots of negatives I think like what 20 years ago the gun dog industry the security industry the police to some extent they all had sort of a negative image because of the training methods that perhaps they used or were perceived to use and I think over the last sort of 15 20 years things have definitely changed and training has become much more positive yes of course there are people out there that use e-collars inappropriately and use harsh methods but I think the majority now of, of, sort of professional trainers that you would go to look at I think most of those methods that they use are positive reward based methods yeah. I mean ultimately 
it's like anything really lots of the training that you do you can't compel a dog to do no like human scent or you know biting a sleeve so it all has to be motivational so no I think on the whole most training methods are actually pretty good there are people that I follow on YouTube that have used collars and a variety of different training aids that I wouldn't necessarily pick up and use myself because it's just not been necessary for me. Um, but they are using really successfully. And I've seen these dogs, I've looked at these dogs' body language, and it's all actually all good. You know, I'm reading body language all the time. You can very clearly see when a dog has been distressed or harmed. And I think certainly things like, you know, killing and chasing of livestock which just breaks my heart there are people that would argue that your bit of chicken or bit of a liver or even your favorite toy is not going to stack up against the chase and kill of livestock so I think it equates the same when you know you're looking at training a powerful protection dog the dog is getting such a massive buzz from grabbing the arm of you know an intruder or whatever you know the fake intruders that they use the buzz that the dog gets from that if you're standing there trying to get that dog off waving a fluffy toy or waving a bit of chicken or waving even a sleeve is that going to be as exciting as the screaming individual the other end so if you were going to train these rottweilers to do this job and you wanted to be 110 percent confident that you said uh, a release command, whatever that word was going to be, and that dog would let go. Would you be 100% confident doing just solely positive, this is much more fun than that, that it would work? Yeah, to answer your question, I think if you're training a dog to do that, then your relationship with the dog has to be right. When you've got the right relationship with the dog and the dog carries out a whole array of obedience actions on your command because it enjoys it and it's used to those rewards and you build up training gradually, then yes, you should have that. I mean, there's a difference, obviously, when you've got, for example, like operational police dogs, because obviously learning experience takes over. So they may well leave on command throughout the training. But then once they've been kicked in the head a few times or in the ribs, then they learn to bite stronger and harder and all the rest of it. I mean, talking about whether reward-based training gets you where you need to get all the time, no, it doesn't. You mentioned livestock and things. I mean, as an example, I was working with a young Springer Spaniel owned by a couple in their late 70s, early 80s. Bit of a Ferrari of a dog, you know, field trials champions in the pedigree and everything. Had issues with the recall. And, you know, it's, it just runs like a mad thing, jumping up, chasing skylarks and just no recall at all. I was working with them for something about three times, trying different recall methods. And none of those would work. All of the recall methods that I had, you mentioned your toolbox earlier, that we have all these training methods and things that we can use. And none of the tools that I had and none of my skill could teach this dog a recall. So I referred the dog to someone that I know that uses modern day e-collars because we got to a point where either this dog is kept on the lead. It's only it's a young dog. It's kept on the lead for life or we somehow teach a recall so that it does have freedom and the owners get to you know enjoy the dog. And so I went and observed the lesson and it was very successful. And now the dog has an amazing life running about off lead, enjoying everything, you know, with his owners going on holiday and all sorts of things. But we couldn't have achieved that using a bit of kibble or a bit of chicken because the, the innate drives, the drive for that dog to do what it wants to do are way more fulfilling, way more rewarding than anything we could offer in a positive fashion. It's not just we couldn't have achieved it. You didn't achieve it. And I think that's the key here that so many dogs are given up on and put down or they end up getting in situations that forces them to be euthanized because other methods are not being considered and I know you know look it's not something that I do um, I'm not in an area with big livestock but you know if I were on the border of Manchester or Yorkshire you know up, up there somewhere I know that the way that livestock is managed the public footpaths the fencing and everything else the vulnerability of that livestock and the interaction of members of the public with their dogs in their areas where they are is really high. So I'm sure behaviourists up there have an absolute hellish time trying to manage these situations because the triggers are there every single walk, every time people step out their door. I've done a fair bit of looking at it. I'm very open to other people's opinions. Certainly when I've looked at some of these real top guys, and you know, Jamie Penrith is, is on YouTube, if anybody knows him, he's very passionate about this. And actually, I've looked at all his videos and read a lot of his articles and stuff and I wouldn't go there because it's my choice I don't want to have to do that the same as I don't want to have to train protection dogs but I have a lot of respect for him and what he does and actually these dogs are living horrendous lives when they're you know they've got their thing that they want to do and they can't because they're on a lead or they're on some sort of figure of eight head collar they're a working dog we've bred to do something and then we're stopping them doing it but they, they've had a taste for it so you know I do think we 
have to stop applying human emotion and actually consider that these dogs are not being painfully electrocuted into the ground. For the most part, everything that I've watched has actually been very subtle. And I know there's a video that Jamie's got on on YouTube where he wears a shock collar himself or e-collar, whatever you want to call them. And he goes through the motions of using it. There's all sorts of arguments for things on other side, but I think ultimately we're all working to the same end game. And that is to give dogs happy, healthy lives and be respectful of their welfare. I've seen some amazingly positive outcomes, dogs living miserable lives to literally within four minutes, being able to be run off lead and, and safely controlled. But I do feel that in the wrong hands, they're terrible and, and can be used in a really negligent manner. And I guess that's what's driving the force right now for them to be banned because of misuse, not the handful of individuals that are managing them. Where do you stand on this whole conversation about e-collars do you think they should be banned no I, I don't think I think they're very much needed you cannot have dogs going around killing livestock or running across roads injuring people getting themselves injured things like that certainly they're not the first port of call for the majority of people lots of people get very emotional about the use of them I think back in the day, they were used in a very different manner. So, you know, if the dog took off chasing a deer, you'd whack it up as hard as you could and shock the dog. People don't use that now. Like you said, there are some very skilled trainers that use them in a very humane fashion and introduce them to the dog slowly and gently. Do I think you should use an e-collar to train your dog? You know, if you're doing bite work or you want to do dog sports, should you use an e-collar to get your dog off a sleeve? Absolutely not. If you can't mm. get your dog to do that, then stop doing it. Should you use one to stop it pursuing livestock or anything that's going to, you know, cause a danger to anybody else or itself, then yes. Should they be available to the general public via Amazon? No. Trainers that use them and specialise in their use should be licensed. And if you need to go and see one of those trainers, then you go through that course rather than buying your own and messing about with it. But like you said, Joe, I mean, all equipment that we can buy for dogs has the potential for misuse and can cause injury to the dogs when not used correctly so I think it's always to go and see a professional certainly you know do your homework and make sure that the people that you use are very au fait very skilled in the use of these collars yeah I mean I was privileged to be within an organization as an observer I wanted to do some extra learning around bite work and understanding that stuff as I say it's just an it's an interest for me it's not something I want to actively do but I watched several dogs being worked on the sleeve and having people running for dogs etc and there's one particular dog who'd been imported who they were struggling to get him to come off the sleeve so he would go on and bite but the bite was just so intense I mean they just they could not get him off at all he just would not let go and I was asked for my opinion actually so obviously because of doing what I do the one of the guys came over and said Joe to be honest this dog's not going to make it you know if you've got any help or advice or anything you can think or what are you observing what do you think and you know what I knew by looking at the dog, that the dog had been trained on an e-collar wherever, he, so it was imported from abroad. So whatever early training that dog had 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 been e-collar trained. So the dog was biting in relation to pain. And because these guys were not using a stimulus of that level, they could not get the dog off. So the dog was basically chomping down waiting for this horrendous stimulant. So this was clearly a, a collar that had been used you know, misused and used incorrectly. Mm. And I came up with it. I was actually quite embarrassed because with a whole bunch of big guys that really know their stuff. So I kind of said, I do have an idea, but you might laugh at me. And my idea was that if this dog has been used in the, or trained in this way, then this dog probably hasn't experienced any degree of positive reinforcement whatsoever. Um, so I made the suggestion that we could try and train this dog with a gun dog whistle. And that's what they did. So they took him away. They positively trained him on a gun dog whistle as a cue to leave sleeve for a positive reward. And I went back two weeks later to see how they were getting on and it had only worked. I mean, I was, even I was absolutely shocked. But what was happening was everything they were doing was the associated behavior with the collar by bringing in a different auditory sound, a new learning pathway associated with something different the dog responded to it and passed his certificate and went on to work, which was amazing. But they had to have that whistle like that was part of the guy's kit.
I heard another story about a young lad put a collar on his little border terrier. Their parents were at the front of the house. They went to seek out what was going on. And the young lad was busy pushing the button on his border terrier while the border terrier was in the garden. Mm. You know, nothing more barbaric than that. Like you say, completely in the wrong hands. The other argument is the people that are, you know, arguing with there are other ways. What other ways? If you've got a dog that's killed livestock, Have you ever seen anybody that proclaims there are other ways and other methods? Have you seen these other methods work? Because I know for sure I would not stump up and say that me waving my dog's favorite toy around if it had killed two sheep is going to get my dog off that sheep. It's never going to happen. There are no Uh, other methods. I don't know. There aren't, are there? There aren't any other methods. I mean, you know, the Springer Spaniel example. I mean, I've been working with dogs professionally for 20 odd years. Um, been involved with them pretty much since you know I was about eight so I've, I've got a fair old bit of kit in my toolbox yeah I could not teach that spring of spaniel to recall because it's innate drives are so strong it's very easy to sit at home with your little Yorkshire terrier on your lap saying oh it's <laughs> you know but when you've got a, a dog a hunting dog that has had lots of repetition of chasing deer or whatever it is there are no other methods to teach that dog a recall that is it mm. I think you've only got to go and look online at the other side of the coin when this poor management of dogs goes wrong and you've got baby lambs fighting for breath, having received serious death-causing injuries because of somebody's pet dog. You've only got to see two or three of those. What we need to make very clear is that doesn't mean the dog is being electrocuted. There's various different levels. There's sound alerts before the dog receives anything, even to pins and needles level. You know, I've had yeah. collars on me. It doesn't, they don't hurt. Most of them are like a TENS machine, aren't they, that you use? Yeah. You know, a herd of sheep or a flock of sheep being chased or lambs being mutilated by dogs. People don't seem to be so worried about that, but the trauma mm. of that is w- way above and beyond any kind of impact that the e collar has on the dog. You know, most yeah. dogs cope with it completely fine, very quickly learn. And then it's a short term fix, really, for a long term solution. And you know what? E stuff, you know, electric fencing and stuff has been around for livestock for a really long time. I've got yeah. electric tape around for my horse. I'll tell you what, I've been caught by the electric fence and it flipping hurts. And my horse is a prey animal. He's not going to be hurting anyone. Yeah. And and yeah, I have to keep him safe. He can't he can't go through, you know, he's a big animal. He can't go through that fence in and I'd lose him. He'd be, you know, off on the nearest dual carriageway. He literally will turn and walk away. He's not being barbarically hurt every day to keep him in his area. He's got beautiful grass, acres to himself. He's fed every day, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think we get so caught up in other people's experiences. And yeah, there are negative experiences, but for every negative experiences, there's potentially, you know, 10, 12, 15 happy dogs now living amazing lives off leads with limitations, getting to free run rather than living a life of frustration on a lead and muzzled because of the danger of walking around the corner and seeing a sheep or yeah. worse, killing livestock every day because owners are completely negligent. If I'm going to have any kind of opinion on anything, then I do like to look at every side of the coin, which I've done of late. And I've actually been really touched by some of these trainers that are using the e-collars about how passionate they are about saving livestock, keeping dogs happy. Their love for animals is off the scale. Yeah, well, we're all we're all on the same side, aren't we? We're all doing this for the good of dogs. The reason we do this is not to cause conflict and give dogs a hard time. The reason that we do this occupation is because we enjoy dogs and we want to give them the best quality of life that we can. And sometimes you have to look outside or think outside the box, don't you, to achieve that? Absolutely. So let's just move on quickly. I just want to chat a little bit about neurologically what you see in these dogs. You've talked a little bit about breed predisposition and being respectful of that. Do you think these guys are hugely predisposed to being intolerant of some degrees of handling? Yeah, I think so. It varies immensely. You know, all individuals are different, aren't they? But yeah, on the whole, I think they have a tolerance level that's not the same as a lot of other dogs and you get to a point where you buy no I've had enough now don't want that it's too over <laughs> oversteps the mark um and they just had enough yeah they really do I mean that's yeah. you know you live with them so I'm sure you've got a better perspective on that than me but I just know my classic Rottweiler case would look something like walking into the house with him all over the place and the owner saying just say hello and you'll be fine thanks mm. very much 
Then you sit on the sofa and then you have him maybe two inches from your nose making this funny noise to which the owner then says, don't worry, he's just introducing himself and chatting. It's just the Rottweiler chat. Yeah. Okay, now I'm really worried I'm going to lose my face because you've rung me for a human aggression problem. So I know your your lovely, handsome, bear-like boy isn't very tolerant of human beings. What is that all about? Some, some of the breed do have what they call a rotty rumble, which is like a cat <laughs> Some of them do growl. And they're quite a vocal... I mean, they growl quite a lot in play. You know, when they're playing with each other and things, it sounds horrendous. They're quite unique in the way that they come across as very friendly. Do you know what I mean? So you go into the cab and they're very friendly in your face and you get a little bit of... Suck, kind of lulled into a little bit of full sense of... Oh, it's nice. It's friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you do, you know, give it a pat on the head or something. It doesn't like that very much. <laughs> um, but, you know, they're all different. I mean, I don't want to make the breed sound dreadful, but um, <laughs> that doesn't happen in my house when you come in that you get greeted in your face and all the rest of it. <laughs> they like things on their terms, I think. So if they want to come over and sit by you and whatever, then they will. Once they've had enough and they don't want that or you do something that oversteps the mark, then you get a very black look over their face. They really do. And I think, you know, the way that we manage dogs in general or rehabilitate them, certainly the early part of most programs, is that you grab the things that are important to the dog and deliver them on your terms so that you can pick and choose what behaviours you want and reward in a really positive fashion for those behaviours and be dismissive of those that you don't want. But with the Rottweiler, that's not always that easy to do because they don't enjoy or get a kick out of you actually taking any degree of control. So I've always found you need to be very clever about how you do that. I tend to walk into houses with Rottweilers and I kind of put my personality in a bit of a box because it's big enough that it doesn't need to be out there in front of a Rottweiler. Yeah. Um, and and kind of just have this, you know, healthy, dismissive this is kind of my space. And if you're respectful of that, then I'll be respectful of your space. You know, they're not a dog that you'd be running into going, hi, how are you? Let's roll around on the floor and play. What's your best, no. what's your favorite toy? No, um, definitely so, wouldn't no. And so it's, but it's a really interesting thing, you know, that you have to be a bit of a chameleon in this job that you need to be changing. You can't go from, you know, a chihuahua to a Rottweiler and be the same. So how do you manage that? That whole resource thing is obviously a big factor with them and we manipulate and use that to our advantage to rehabilitate these dogs. How would you walk into a house? I guess I'm interested to know. I know how I do it, but how would you do it? Rather stupidly, I do some dog assessments for Rottweiler Rescue. <laughs> so go into houses with these dogs without even getting paid for it. I mean, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> um, I mean, no, I kind of ignore them completely, really. Even when they come up, I might give them a little tickle under the chin or whatever, but typically I'm very hands off. They're quite, when you have them, I think they're easier to read. The minute little changes that flicker over their face when things change. But I think as an owner, you have to kind of manage. So would you actually tell one of these dogs, you know, you've been in the house, say, half an hour, 45 minutes, had a bit of a chat to the owner, dog's lent on you, dog's grumble, gun away, whatever it's doing. At what point would you be hands on? Would you actually, would you actually even take control of that situation or would you just work around the dog? I mean, it's easy if the dog is kind of bouncing off the ceiling and being invasive and loud. Generally, they might be a little bit boisterous, but you need to know what you're doing. You need a higher yeah. skill set to be going and even considering these dogs that have problems. At what point would you start harnessing that dog's behavior and actually trying to channel? Would you do it out of the house? Would you do it in the house? How would you kind of, if somebody booked you to come and see their Rottweiler that's maybe just started a bit of low level aggression and resource guarding? You've done the chat, you've sat down, you've introduced yourself to the dog. Would you get the owner to do all the work or would you owner, take control? I'd get the owner to do a fair bit. As with anything, I'd make my observations throughout the first part of the consult and then decide based on that what handling I was going to do. But even when you're handling, you just don't get complacent, do you? You don't just no. stand there with a lead in your hand and then chatting to the owner and looking at the sky. You're no. very mindful of every action that you take and what possible reaction there could be and how you could manage that. And I think if you don't know how you manage what might happen, then you shouldn't be doing it. We've got obviously a mutual friend and colleague that I was privileged to work with one of her rotties around resources and it was the best learning curve for me. Yeah. And I just remember, you know, we were just doing leave the toy, it's mine, have the toy, leave the toy, it's mine. You know, I was just walking him around on a lead and he was loving it and I just felt really empowered. I mean, an absolutely amazing feeling working a, a big dog like that. But, you know, I did it a few times and then it was enough. And yeah. I literally handed the lead to her and walked off. It was just yeah. the funniest thing. Like my stomach 
didn't quite go over, <laughs> but I just turned around and said to her, he's done. And yeah. you know what? Someone walking past wouldn't have had a clue. And she, I handed the lead to her and she said, you have read him absolutely spot on. He's done. Yeah. And I know, Ross, that if I had carried on, that wouldn't have been pretty. No. Because he was done and he clearly told me he was done. You know, it was no issue. You just have to be able to read. And I think that's the thing that if you've got family and you've got kids and you're not respecting innate drives, it's what people don't read. And that's when accidents happen, isn't it? You get complacent or you're not observing or your mind's elsewhere while you're doing things. And then, yeah. yeah. We're certainly not here painting any breed in a poor light at all. You know, it, it's really educational, the perspective that we're coming from. So with that in mind, people have got these dogs and they've done their research and it's all great. I also think there's quite a lot of conflicting information out there. And, and particularly, I want to focus on neutering. Now, you know, there, there are lots and lots of studies that have gone on about when to neuter, when the best time is, what breeds do well, being neutered early, et cetera. And I find the whole thing really confusing. And I have studied a lot of the research. Yeah, there was a study in 2002 that found that male and female dogs that underwent the spaying or castration process before a year of age had an approximate one in four lifetime risk for bone sarcoma. And I actually, my puppy coach videos, the Rottweiler that's in there, the family, their previous Rottweiler died very young for exactly that reason, because they had yeah. him muted at six months. So yeah. it does seem to be that Rottweilers are predisposed to this issue. But then you have the fact that you have this big, powerful breed that's generally very confident with then a very confident hormone coming into play from kind of four and a half, five months. So what do you do with yours? Do you keep them entire? I do keep them entire. I mean, Rottweilers do have a high um, propensity to various types of cancer. Osteosarcoma is particularly um, prevalent in the breed. But neutering, as you said, there are lots of surveys out there that say that the earlier your dog is neutered, the higher the risk of cancer later on in life. So no, I do keep my dogs entire. I know you've got a brand new pupster that's come into the mix yeah. recently. So what canine friends have you got living in your home right now? I've got two males and two females. The females are neutered. I tried to do that after the second season. So they have two seasons and then a spade. I wouldn't do that if I didn't have male dogs. And that really is due also to the inconvenience of the cycle. So you can't, you know, you can't travel anywhere, can't plan anything. Plus difficulty managing with all the dogs together. I wouldn't spay bitches either if I didn't have to until perhaps later in life. So you've got two entire males? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two entire male Rottweilers. You're not living in a 10 bedroom mansion with 15 acres, are you? You're kind of in a normal house. Like, yeah. how, do, how, how have you managed those development phases? Like you said, I mean, really, the whole thing of living with dogs like this is perhaps management. You do have to have appropriate kind of rules and boundaries, and everybody needs to know where they stand and the rules in relation to the house and what they can do and what they can't do. And then we, we have harmony. The rules thing, the limitations, the word leadership, all this terminology is becoming so grey and this creates so much conflict for new owners or carers or, you know, whatever we want to call people that own dogs these days because, again, they've got new names. You know, yeah, a lot of people. And all that. Yeah. yeah, they're parents and they're carers and they're what I can't get around my head around the carer thing, you know, you, if you own a dog, you own a dog. I always just just think, you know, if I was arriving somewhere into a country where everybody spoke a completely different language and I had no wingman telling me, these are the rules, this is when we eat, this is how we eat, don't do this because that person will be upset by it, this is when you sleep and this is your area. I go into so many houses now where the dogs are just, you're peeling them off the ceiling because there are no rules and the owner's perception is very much... They have this amazing life, they sleep where they want, they get food when they want, there's food down all the time. And oh my God, that just upsets me so much because the conflict in the animal and the reason these animals are becoming intolerant, frustrated, irritable, aggressive, and ultimately potentially put down or rehomed is because nobody wants to put a rule in. Yeah, <laughs> why, do, yeah. why does no one want to do that anymore? It doesn't make any sense. I don't find it too dissimilar to having children. Do you know what I mean? It's no. Just the kids like the rules and they probably would say that they didn't but everybody likes to know where they stand don't they we all do we all like to know what we can do what we can't do and then live within confines yeah. of that and dogs you see it all the time and when you go into a home and you make changes to the way that people are living with their dogs in order to bring about behavioral change you see the dogs just exhale or sort of decompress and just like oh thank god someone knows what they're doing yeah fine i'll follow <laughs> you 
Do you know what yeah. I mean? Rather than just this yeah. mess all the time. Yeah. And I think that's the whole chat about, you know, you can't mention the word dominance or alpha dog or anything like that. And I think it's not really anything to do with that. They know we're humans. You know, there's yeah. masses of studies out there that dogs recognize we are not the same species of them. When puppies are, are mouth in my hands, I do not scream because all that does is rev up their excitement and make them bite you harder yeah. because I'm not another puppy. So I'm not delivering any of the other body language that goes with that. I just find the whole thing very frustrating that species values have been lost now to the point where it's so detrimental for the dog because we're lost in this world as professionals as well as just, you know, dog owners that's full of conflict and opinions. You've got different opinions to me. And, you know, likewise, we've got other colleagues that, you know, we're all very close because we discuss cases and we have such healthy, happy, educational discussions about cases. You always laugh at me that my consults are like double the time of yours because I can't yeah. stop talking. And that's the way that I run my consults. And, you know, that doesn't mean that there's any negative difference between you or I. We just choose options to rehabilitate and work with our clients based on our own personalities and characters. If we weren't different, then we'd have nobody to talk to to get further advice or help no. or learn different methods because we'd all just be the same and all the rest of it, wouldn't we? So it's nice to be able to share ideas and look at cases and see different approaches. And if I do something that I think, oh, that's not the most effective, that doesn't seem to be working, speak to Joe, try a different method, you know, yeah. what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like I'm chatting to you about Rotties and I have done, you know, as you know, I didn't have a great time with a big, powerful breed a few years back. And yeah. you and, and a couple of other colleagues were amazing in getting me back to where I'm at now. And within a very short period of time, just having you guys there to bring some sort of reality on that was a isolated incident. And what can I learn from that and move on, which is exactly what I did being aware and respectful of the and I've said you know the word respect a lot but I think people don't respect that they've bought a Rottweiler. To be honest with you Joe I don't think people respect dogs very much anyway I mean this whole sort of fur baby culture that you're just sort of talking about whereby yeah. we buy them little pink harnesses and strap them to our back and carry them around I mean people think they're being kind and lovely but actually dogs don't like that they what they're no. dogs they're not kids and they like rolling in fox poo and eating sheep poo and yeah. chasing squirrels and you know peeing up your curtains all of those <laughs> things that's dogs isn't it we should Absolutely. be having dogs because we want dogs not because we want a little teddy bear or a, a little child yeah. get one of those instead I think the culture that we're in you know the social media culture of I've got this massive bull breed or rotty or shepherd and look at it snuggled up with my one-year-old baby on the sofa is sending a message to those people that maybe are new to dog ownership that oh you know the dog just arrives and it adapts really quickly and it's all great and it's just sending such a negative message and it's one of the reasons I wanted to chat to you it was not to necessarily isolate rottweilers as a whole as being you know really difficult dogs because if you know what you're doing they're actually really easy yeah, they're much easier to read than a cockapoo or a mixed breed um, dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah they really are but it was really just to highlight what's happened in the industry and and how we're kind of missing the point it's not about what the dog looks like it, it is actually about the reality of being able to give these dogs a really nice life I mean, like you said, these pictures that people put around of babies sitting on the back of dogs and all of those horrendous things that you see create this kind of culture whereby we think that dogs should tolerate that being pulled around by your kids. Well, no, it doesn't have to tolerate that. You need to control your children and, and create a safe environment for everybody, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess just to round it up, certainly I've seen quite a few people getting Rottweilers over the last 18 months and if they're coming through to me as behaviour, then obviously things are going wrong as well. So, you know, we've pretty much done the advice if you're going to get a dog like this. Obviously, we've talked about what you would consider. But do you think these dogs make good domestic pets to have chilled laying around your home with maybe two walks a day? No, not really. I mean, there are exceptions in the breed. There are some Rottweilers that are fat and lazy and <laughs> very friendly, sort of Labradors in drag. <laughs> and people will tell you, no, they're lovely. This one's love using that one as an example. But no, all of those breeds you listed, particularly like the Malinois, I've seen so many people since the lockdown that are getting Malinois or Dutch Herder. Yeah. And um, they are not pet dogs. They're not suited to living in your apartment in central London. And most of the dogs, the shepherds included, the German shepherds, need an awful lot of mental and physical activity and stimulation. Unless you really are interested in, the, in dogs, in the breed, then no, there are far more suitable dogs to go and purchase than any of those. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think we had a joke, didn't we, that I, my new puppy that's arriving, I did I did tell all you guys that I was buying a Malinois just to see what the reaction was with my two young kids in the house. And you guys were even, it's a bit laughable in the nicest possible way because it doesn't matter on my knowledge at this point. It matters that, you know, I live in a three-bed semi with two yeah. kids. And you haven't got the time. You haven't I got haven't got the time. time. Have a Malinois, no. Mm-hmm. Hopefully well, people will find this really useful just as a, a quick overview of the breed and the industry and, you know, chatting about different training methods and different opinions. And hopefully it will create a higher level of understanding for, for people when they're in conflict, when they read stuff. Is there anything, Ross, that you think is really pertinent for people to know? I think really... Um... <clears throat> my biggest frustration is people when they go and buy a puppy not doing any research and like I said since particularly since lockdown people are going and buying breeds that are completely unsuited to their lifestyle and then you know causing problems for the dog having to look at rehoming or returning to the breeder or or worse so I think you know people should be seeking help from a professional if you are considering having a dog then at least you can do is to have a chat to a canine behaviorist a dog trainer dog breeders whatever else so that you make sure you're getting the right dog for your family I've got puppy coach, you know, you've got smart puppy DVD out there. And I know for sure the people that have gone through puppy coach, like the people I've done consults with before they've even got a breeder have done so well. Like by the time these dogs are four months old, they don't need me. Like they're done. They get it. They do their daily training. They do their bits and pieces. They're prepped for adolescence. They're prepped for adulthood. And I get really frustrated because buying the puppy coach package is obviously a lot cheaper and efficient to help people be educated than it is trying to track me down and find a slot for me to come out and work with you for six to eight weeks to rehabilitate your dog, which is obviously going to financially cost you a hell of a lot more money when it goes wrong. Shame that people aren't into prevention, isn't it? You know, they don't do anything to prevent issues arising. They just wait until it occurs and then try and seek help. Yeah, it's a sorry state, but we can only do our bit, can't we? And on a positive yeah. note, we are fixing everything that comes our way, which is great, or finding solutions for it. And I certainly know that the industry is on a bit of an upturn with a lot of people now getting involved, wanting to see some sort of legislation and, and regulation, although I think regulation is a long way off for us guys. Ross, if people want to find you, you know, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you if they've got questions or they want help with their powerful breeds so basically you can contact me through my website the london dog behavior company and the website is rossmccarthy.com perfect thank you so much it's always really lovely to chat to you we always have a a good old chat about various things going on but it's nice to get something down and and recorded and hopefully people will find it a benefit yeah thanks ross all right thanks for having me thanks so much for listening this week i hope you found the podcast informative And please do subscribe if you want to hear more topics. They'll be brought to you over the next few weeks.